I'm reading Storm Runners, the first quadrant, Eruption. This is book three, and um, I'm reading it with permission by Scholastic. 10.35 a.m. Remember, they're in Mexico, and, um, and, and, and uh, the mountain is erupting. Arturo was an exact copy of Tomas, only younger and with a small chimpanzee in his lap. Nicole picked the chimpanzee up and gave it a hug. It seemed happy to see her. How is the dentist, Arturo asked. Chase smiled and showed his new tooth. Bueno. Chase pointed at the chimpanzee. What's his name? It's a she, and her name is Chiquita. Chiquita wasn't alone. There were two camels, a black bear, a tiger, and a good-sized crowd of people gawking at the animals. Gawking means kind of staring and pointing. Arturo had roped off the area to keep the spectators at a distance. Spectators are watchers. You should charge an entrance fee, Nicole said. I'm thinking about it. They're here from morning until darkness. I have to pay children to bring me food. Chase looked at Arturo's old sleeping bag and rumpled clothes in the back of the truck. Since meeting Nicole, he had thought more than once about becoming a circus roustabout when he got older. That sight took some of the romance out of the idea. <coughs> Sleeping in the back of a truck without being able to leave to get food did not sound like much fun. I take it you're not coming with us, Nicole said. The only way I could go would be to take the animals with me, but of course that won't work. I'll wait here in case your mother shows up while you're out looking for her. The clowns will be happy to see Chiquita, Nicole explained to Chase. Chiquita and her twin brother Chico are part of their act. Chiquita was under the weather when the show headed south, so we held her back. But you're all better, aren't you now, Chiquita? Chiquita gave her a hoot and a high five. Two brand new white 4x4 trucks pulled up, equipped with crew cabs, roll bars, auxiliary lights, and power winches. Strapped down to the bed of each truck was a quad. The side of both trucks were stenciled in red. MD Emergency Services. The MD didn't stand for medical doctor, but sometimes the authorities thought it did, and Chase's father didn't correct them. It helped get them into restricted areas. So it looks like we're still talking about tries. <clears throat> MD stood for Masters of Disaster. It was his father's little joke, but his father wasn't joking now. He climbed out of the truck, all business. He didn't even ask about Chase's tooth. The new sat phones have GPS. Keep the phone with you at all times. I also got these. He handed Bluetooth earpieces to Chase and Nicole. Cindy, Mark, and Tomas already had theirs in. His father's Bluetooth flashed just above his lightning bolt earring. That lightning is still looking for you, Mama Rossi had said. Chase wondered if the bolt had found his father while he'd been at the dentist. John Masters looked completely charged and clearly in charge. Chase smiled. Lightning John is a perfect name for him. The phones are synced with each other and will act like walkie-talkies, his father continued. If you answer, you'll be able to hear everyone and everyone will be able to hear you. Just tap the Bluetooth if you want to listen in. Mark and Cindy will ride with me. Chase and Nicole will ride with Tomas. When we get closer to Pueblo, we'll decide our next steps. And one more thing. He gave each of them a small zippered case. Respirators in case we run into ash up on the mountain. Put them in your go bags. Any questions? Now these respirators are the small ones that you wear like when you're going diving in the ocean or when you're painting or um, not just the mask, but it has air. It's not like the respirators they're talking about in the hospital. That's a bigger machine. <clears throat> no one had any questions or if they did, they didn't ask out loud. Mark was filming the whole thing. That's a question killer, Chase thought. Who wants to ask a dumb question with the camera rolling? Tomas gave Arturo a hug and got into his truck. Chase and Nicole climbed in after him. Chase looked back as they drove away. His father was already getting into his truck behind them. Arturo was waving. Chiquita had her hand up too. Was your dad in the military? Nicole asked as they pulled into the highway. Navy, Chase answered, but it was before he married my mom. What did he do in the Navy? I never ask him and he never talks about it. Why? He seems... I don't know, organized, I guess. He's certainly organized. Most contractors are. Circus people are organized too, Nicole said, but your dad is extra organized. We've been here less than five hours and he's mounted a full-scale expedition inside a foreign country. Mexico is hardly a foreign country. Look at this truck and all this special gear. He had to get a car dealer out of bed at the crack of dawn to get these trucks. Chase looked around the cab. 
It smelled new. The only things that weren't new were the laminated photos of Tomas's eight children and his wife, Guadalupe, duct taped to the dash. Above them was Tomas's plastic statue of St. Christopher, the patron saint of travelers. He's also invoked against lightning, Chase thought. Not a problem today. There isn't a cloud in the sky. People are driving, sleeping, going about their day as if Popocatepetl, the smoking mountain, or Tomas said. The smoking mountain was smoking. A plume of white steam rose 10,000 feet above the nearly 18,000 foot peak. I didn't realize it was so close to Mexico City, Chase said. Nicole turned and said something to Tomas in what sounded to Chase like pretty good Spanish. Tomas responded and they continued speaking rapidly as the volcano loomed larger in the district. When they stopped talking, Chase asked Nicole about her Spanish. Circuses are international, Nicole said. The acts are from all over the world, but most of our roustabouts are Hispanic. I was asking Tomas about his family. They live in a village called Lago de la Montaña, or Lake of the Mountain. I guess people call it Lago for short. It's on the east side of the mountain, just below the rim. So not a good place to be right now, Chase said. No, Tomas said. They drove on in silence. 12 p.m. Noon, his father said over the Bluetooth. Chase looked at his watch. Exactly. Pull over where the road splits. Tomas pulled the four by four onto the shoulder. Everyone got out. We haven't seen another car in half an hour, Chase's father said. My guess is nobody's getting in or out of Puebla, at least not on this road, and I don't like the look of that plume. The plume is the smoke that's rising up out of the mountain. We need to split up so we can cover more ground. I'll continue toward Puebla and see what we're up against. Tomas will head up to Lago and make sure his family's okay. Then I want to ride with you to Puebla, Nicole said to John. I figured that. He looked at Cindy and Mark. One of you needs to go with Tomas and Chase. I'll do it. Cindy said, Mark needs to shoot the video. I'm extra baggage. Except for Tomas and Lightning John, we're all extra baggage, Chase thought. He would have preferred to travel with Nicole, but he understood her wanting to go to Puebla, where her mother and sister might be. And he understood his father's reason for going to Puebla right away. The plume, what they could see of it now so close to the mountain, had turned from white to gray in the last half hour. Tomas had told them that didn't necessarily mean the volcano was going to be a problem. The steam and ash were common, but Chase could tell he was worried about it. Nicole and Cindy went to pick up their go bags. John waved Chase over to the guardrail to talk to him alone. You okay with Nicole going with me? You okay with Cindy going with me? Chase asked. His father grinned. Actually, I am. Take care of her and take care of yourself. What do you want us to do when we find Tomas's family? He looked up the mountainside. It's up to Tomas, but I'd get them out of there. I just really don't like the look of that plume. Do you know anything about volcanic eruptions? A little. I was in a bad eruption in Indonesia before you were born. When you were in the Navy? His father nodded. Why were you in Indonesia? This trip down to Mexico was Chase's first time out of the country, but apparently it was not his father's. I was sent there to help some people, to rescue them. From an eruption? Not exactly. Look, let's talk about this another time. We need to get moving. Sure, Chase said. Just another thing he doesn't want to talk about. He walked over to Nicole. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. She burst out laughing. It can't be worse than the hurricane. Chase looked up at the gray plume. He wasn't so sure. 12.22 p.m. The bridge is out, John said. There were three army trucks parked on their side of the bridge and no vehicles on the Puebla side. He slowed to a stop and then consulted his GPS. I'll go talk to them, Nicole said. I'll go with you, Mark said. Ask them when the bridge went out, John said, pulling a topographical map from the glove box to compare the map on his phone. The bridge had spanned a deep gully 300 feet across. A third of the bridge was now gone. Nicole asked the soldiers when it had collapsed, but they didn't know exactly. They'd been sent from Mexico City right after the earthquake hit. When they called in and reported the bridge was out, their commander told them to stay put until they were relieved. The sergeant asked if Nicole had any spare food or water. She sent Mark to see what Mr. Masters could spare. Did you see any circus trucks drive up to the other side? Or did you pass any circus trucks on your way up here? Nicole asked in Spanish. The sergeant shook his head. 
but he had heard about the circus. His cousin had gone to see it in Puebla. He had been planning to take his family when the circus performed in Mexico City. That may not happen, Nicole told him. She went on to explain her connection to the circus and gathered as much information from the man as she could. <coughs> a few minutes later, Mark and John walked up with a box of food and water and handed it to the soldiers. Nicole filled them in. The sergeant thinks my mother and sister and the rest of the circus probably started out of Puebla, found they couldn't get far on the ruined roads and turned back. So maybe they're safe. We're stranded somewhere on the road, or worse, she thought. She continued aloud. He says there are several roads and trails through the mountains, but they're only passable with a four-wheel drive. I think I found a way around the bridge, John said. Ask him about the volcano. I already did, she told him. He said the same thing as Tomas. He isn't worried either. He told me the mountain lets out steam all the time and it's nothing serious. He's guessing the earthquake opened a fissure in the crater, but it will close up in a couple of days. It always does, he said. John gave the sergeant his phone number and asked him to call if he heard anything about the circus or warnings about the volcano. Back in the truck, he showed Nicole and Mark the map, moving his finger along the road he was planning to take. It looks more like a trail than a road, Mark said. It is a trail, John admitted. It swings back around to the highway on the other side of the bridge. If it's wide enough and not too steep, we should be able to make it. If it's still there after the earthquake, Mark said. John put the truck in four-wheel drive. If the trail's not there, we'll make our own. Mark rolled his eyes. Here we go again. What are you talking about, Nicole asked. When we ran out of roads during the hurricane, Lightning John here and his sidekick Tomas decided to redefine the meaning of off-road vehicle. At one point, we were stuck on a train trestle. I can't tell you how much fun that was. John smiled. Lightning John, huh? I gather Chase told you. It's not the worst nickname I've had. He bumped the truck off the highway and headed into the trees. 12.33 p.m. In some ways, <clears throat> the volcano reminded Chase of Mount Hood. The dense blanket of evergreen trees, the steep winding logging roads, the small patches of snow surviving in the shade. Before the lightning strike, before everything had changed, his family had owned a cabin on Mount Hood. They had spent almost as much time as, at the cabin as they did in their regular home. His father had even been a volunteer on the Mount Hood Ski Patrol. Chase's best memories were from their time on the mountain. His worst memory was too. So tell me something Chase, about Chase Masters, Cindy said. She was sitting between him and Tomas. There's not much to tell, Chase said. Cindy laughed. You sound like your dad. You sound like a reporter. Guilty as charged, it's in my blood. My parents are both journalists. Where do they live, Chase asked. Southern California, in the same house I grew up in. So you know about earthquakes. I've been in my share of quakes, and of course I've covered them for television. How about volcanoes? The only volcano I've covered is Mount St. Helens in Washington. I did a story about it the last time it acted up. It blew some steam and ash for a few days and then went back, back down to sleep and went back to sleep. I hope Popocatepetl does the same. Chase hoped so too, but his TBG was telling him otherwise. How often had his father said the gut barometer? That's how you feel inside your gut. I hope you listen to your gut barometer. How often had his father said the gut barometer is never wrong, so always listen to your TGB. His father believed that everyone had a TGB. It worked like a real barometer. Barometer tells you the, the pressure. So it hangs on the wall and it's got um, liquid in a glass and it goes up and down, depending upon the, the air pressure. It worked like a real barometer, but instead of hanging on a wall, it was in your solar plexus. When you feel the bottom drop out of your gut, you better go on full alert, his father always said. Right now, Chase's gut was somewhere between his knees and his ankles. He hoped the feeling of hollow dread was an after effect of the Novocaine. Or maybe I'm just hungry. hungry. He hadn't eaten anything since the airplane. He pulled an energy, out of, an energy bar out of his go bag and offered half to Cindy. No thanks, let's get back to Chase Masters. Like I said, there's not much to tell. I was born and raised in Oregon. Two years ago, my mother and sister were killed in an auto accident. One year ago, my father was struck by lightning in our backyard. When he came out of the coma, he sold my uncle his share in their construction company and we hit the road. 
I go to school while my father and Tomas charge people a lot of money to put their property back together. I'm sorry to hear about your mom and sister, Cindy said. I can't imagine how difficult that's been. Thanks. As far as your father charging people a lot of money to fix things, I suspect he spent most, if not all, of his profit on this little excursion. If he didn't have the cash, we'd be back in Florida worrying about Tomas and Nicole's families instead of down here trying to find them. Chase shrugged. She had a point, but his father was not a psychic like Mama Rossi. He hadn't been charging people because he knew that one day he would have to save Tomas and Nicole's families. I can see you're not convinced, Cindy said. It's hard for men like your father to give up their training. What training? His SEAL training. <clears throat> As in sea, air, and land? The Navy SEALs? That's right. My father was not a Navy SEAL. Navy SEALs are a really special part of the armed forces. They're really highly trained and they drop them in to rescue people. They perform missions other people can't do. Chief Petty Officer John Sebastian Masters. Sebastian? Don't tell me you didn't know your father's middle name. I knew the initial, Chase said, which sounded weak even to him. Did he tell you he was a Navy SEAL? No. Then how... You don't think I'd really pick your dad for a documentary subject without doing some research first. I guess not, Chase said. How could I not have known something so important? My little brother, well, not so little anymore as a Navy SEAL. We live close to Coronado, California, where SEAL Team 1 is based. I can't remember a time when my brother didn't want to become a SEAL. His bedroom was plastered with SEAL paraphernalia and Navy recruiting posters. Your father was younger in the photo, of course, but I recognized him from one of those posters. I called my brother to verify it. He said John Sebastian Masters is the real deal. Your dad's exploits in Asia are the things of SEAL Team One legend. Chase's father's voice echoed in his head. I was in a bad eruption in Indonesia before you were born. I was sent down there to help rescue some people. Chase still couldn't believe he hadn't heard any of this before. His mother had to have known his father had been a SEAL. What kind of operations, Chase asked. My brother wouldn't tell me, the little creep. He said they were classified. Chase looked over at Tomas. He had both hands on the steering wheel and was looking straight ahead as if he wasn't paying the slightest attention to their conversation. Did he know about his partner's past? What did my dad say when you asked him about being a SEAL? I didn't ask him. Why not? If they weren't driving up an active volcano, he'd be on the sat phone with his father right now, demanding an answer. Good question, Cindy said. I guess I was waiting for him to say something about it, but the fact that he didn't tells me even more about him than if he had. How so? Well, I know a lot of ex-seals. They're a proud bunch, and they're delighted to talk about their accomplishments. Then along comes someone like your dad, who didn't even tell you about it. I assumed that you knew. I probably shouldn't have said anything. I'm glad you did, Chase said, and don't worry. When I ask him about it, I'll figure out a way to do it without pointing at you. I'd appreciate that. Cindy looked out the windshield at the darkening sky. The only easy day was yesterday, she said. What do you mean? That's the seal's motto. Chase hoped it wasn't true. Think about what that means. The only easy day was yesterday.